Making life worth living and a retirement worth having is about the men and women in our lives, the people that we allow to come into our life and literally have an impact on us. It's the liaisons we make in business. It's the colleagues we have in employment. It's the people we practically spend our lunch hours with or the people that came into our lives before we got into our career life. You see, sometimes in life we carry people with us from long ago. There are plenty of people who like to go to their high school reunions and catch up on old times and reminisce about old days and old memories. Also to meet people again to produce new relationships with people they might still have some sort of affinity with. I like the term affinity because it's really talking about how we produce ourselves in a moment of time. We can create alliances in seconds and we can create enemies in minutes, but openly that's no different than creating a sale in seconds and losing the sale in minutes. I often said that in marketing to people that I was talking to who were presidents of their own companies, that literally their own souls and their own emotional capabilities of managing their feelings is what was projecting and predicting their performance and their prosperity. I might be able to say the same thing about my own self, but openly I had a simple practice. I literally took in only a handful of clients and I produced other income for myself in my language school, which we've now all learned has been stolen from me completely off hard drives and destroyed every single file, literally thousands of my lessons and my classroom projects for my children and adults have been deleted off hard drives that I owned in my property bags that I carried with me in homelessness. I did not do that. Someone else clearly did based on what's been left on the drives. If they just moved them into folders, shame on them for the vandalism on my work. Now, in life, we have moments of time to make a difference for people. And when we have an impact on a soul, we really make an indentation in a life. In my personal life, I have only had a few liaisons is something that I can openly share as a man, that when we have a moment of time of intimacy with someone, it is a shared moment. It is literally a moment that stands still. It's a moment that we hope will last. It's a moment that we pro profess to never forget. And it's a moment that holds us in our souls and hearts and minds as that was a good moment. I openly can share a story of my own life of going to dinner with someone that I really loved. I produced the ability to invite her to go out to dinner one day when I was alone and she was alone and it just seemed like the right thing to do. I was hungry, she was hungry, she didn't have any responsibilities at that moment, and her kids were well cared for. So we literally went to Kincaid's, which is no longer at Clay Terrace, which is a place within my community of northern Indianapolis, a little bit stone's throw from my family residence at the time. I was openly sitting there eating with her, and I had produced some cash through working at a Japanese restaurant part-time so that I had some extra play money for me to utilize in my own way with no worries about what I needed to do with life for my family or my business practice or anything else. I utilized that cash to pay, not that it matters, but it meant to me because I was literally doing that job because I wanted to be able to provide for her something in a time of her little hours of need. And frankly, it was a delight for me to go to that restaurant with her. The fact that she acquiesced in that moment and allowed me to change my pants at least and put on a sport coat so that we could go to that restaurant. Well, ladies can get away with any attire, but guys need to look a little bit sharper in places like that. And openly, I sat there eating my dinner, listening to the woman I love talk about her life. I profess that I wish that I was a little bit more in tune with what she was saying. I remember parts of the conversation. I wish literally I had remembered everything word for word. But the truth is, I was sitting there in my mind, actually thinking, I have never been happier in my life. Now, as a man, it's hard to profess that. But because we don't talk about those moments of time very often in public, we certainly don't share them a lot with men in general practice, unless we have a really good guy, pal, buddy, that we can talk about those moments of time. 
but generally speaking, guys don't mark those moments with lots of people. They might share it with a gal pal, or they might profess it in front of a pastor in private, but openly I'm saying publicly that that lovely moment of the only time I've ever gone to that restaurant in Clay Terrace was one of the happiest moments of my entire adult life. I had other moments like that in Japan, of course, with the spouse that I had of many years, but openly that moment was unique to me. I was literally sitting there pleased with myself, not for what I had accomplished in that moment, but merely for the fact that I had had that chance to literally enjoy that lovely person and her soul and her talk and the way it sings to my soul, her vo vocal tones, to just enjoy that moment of time of being present as fully as I could possibly be in my absolute happiness and acknowledging that within my soul that I was happy, literally ecstatic, actually, of literally listening to her talk. She wanted to share with me her asparagus, and I was sort of feeling like she didn't eat a whole lot, and I really wanted her to fill herself and feel like she could eat whatever she liked because I had 200 bucks cash at least on me, and I could have easily paid for three meals for us there, at least, plus dessert in cash and not worried about putting it on a charge card or a bank card or anything else, and men consider those things. One of my male mentors in a Christian men's group told me that most men he knew, and he made the practice of mentoring, kept $100 cash in their wallet at all times for emergency situations. He was also a mega earner in terms of the fact that his family owned a shoe lineage store, and we'll talk more about him another time. But in reality, I was just pleased because I was happy, I was in love with the soul, and I just felt the Lord in those moments, saying this is what it's supposed to feel like. This is how it's supposed to be in life. That in reality, we're supposed to have people that we love so much that we are just pleased to be in their presence, basking in the highlight of their spirit, letting their souls shine, telling stories, recalling facts, giving information, and practically producing relationship. Intimate sort of relationship because I was getting told about past loves of her life. Who she should have married instead of who she did marry, and other little parts that I won't reveal now, but I remember those highlights for sure. Because I was literally interested in marrying her, I believe at that moment in time. It hadn't fully formulated in my brain, but it was certainly something I felt in my soul that I would love to marry a woman like that. What a lucky man she had in her life to have her as a loving partner and wife and business acumen that she has is off the charts in my mind. And openly, we probably talked about business things too, but it was a personal conversation. One of the many we had had over the course of a long period of talking and texting and all sorts of things. The truth is that throughout that period of time, everywhere I went, despite her being present or not, there was oddly another person with her name. It became sort of a running joke for me that I would say, you know, who's sitting in front of me, don't you? In a text message to her or something like that when I went to a parent's church. or It just seemed to happen no matter where I went, no matter where I went that the Lord was saying, this is the one. Now, since that time, there's literally been hundreds of signs with the same little person's names, initials, and the way that the Lord shows me her and reminds me of her every single day. I pray for her. I pray for the life of her children. And openly, my hope is always that I'll see her again. The other day, I actually had that chance. It was a profound moment, frankly. And I'd like to recount it just so people understand how God works in a life. I had been instructed to go by the Lord as I lived my life in that way only by submission to a local Target store. I had spent literally several hours walking the store, making notes on horrible receipts, which one of my siblings has stolen or dropped in a car when she pilfered in my bag, but we'll get to that later, and openly looking at products and learning what's a good quality product and what is not and what I should have in a future home and looking at prices and figuring out what I need to get in 
why I want to target charge card or whatever they're called, gift card or all that sort of stuff. And frankly, the Lord said, okay, it's time. I'm like, okay, I'm not sure what it's time for, but I do what I'm told. And I literally started to walk. And God said, okay, we're going to walk down this aisle right here. I want you to turn to go south. Then I want you to turn right. And just as I turn right, here's what I heard the Holy Spirit say. The Lord keeps all his promises. Here the Lord has kept his promise to you today. And lo and behold, right there, pushing a cart, looking at her phone in beautiful glass on her aging face, <clears throat> was the woman that I love so much. Of course, a man like me is not accustomed to those moments of time, and I literally had to ask God, what am I supposed to do now? And he said, pass by right now. And I realized why. Because later in the evening, I was harmed by people. And if we had connected at that moment of time, she might have been harmed as well. And I will protect her at all costs. I will give my life to protect her and her boys, and that is my lawful right to say so. That when a love is strong like this, when the Lord puts a love in a soul like this, he does not waver in his decisions in the heaven above about who is right for who, who should love who, and whether or not I love is my choice to love. And when I've let it go so many times, the Holy Spirit says, just don't let go. Love is the most important principle of all things we all do in life. Loving people is the most important thing we offer to others. And how we love them sometimes is to let them go. How we love them sometimes is pass them by. How we love them is to listen to the Lord saying, it's not quite time yet. How we love them is to practically listen to what the Lord is saying, that we are not God, that he is, and that when the time is right, when the opportunity is right, when the love is right, when the peace of mind is right, that's when life is right. Now, I talk about this because I want to share that story. I literally want people to share stories like that more in the world. We need to focus on love in ways that make sense. We need to understand that people have loving moments in time that really occur for them in their minds and in their hearts and in their memories. But we also have moments of time when we have to literally let go of that love, put our love on hold in a moment, because I've been dying to see her for a long time, at least seven years, perhaps. But in reality, when a man needs to protect those he loves, he has to give that service of protection to the Lord. He has to let the Lord guide him in all those things. And I've been guided in many ways before. That I've literally seen signs of that. And I can talk about the day and how many of my earthly signs that the Lord does provide those who walk a native Indian type of faith of Christianity and Buddhism and Zen and Confucianism and all the different uh, little faiths that I have profess to like and read about to expand my knowledge of the heavens of, of the earth and the Lord and of God of Most High, that in reality, what we're talking about here is letting the Lord lead us and produce for us a life. Mostly, people are looking for love. They are practically looking for a place to belong. They're looking for a place to be able to talk about spirituality, to be able to talk about their soul to be able to talk about their hardships, to be able to share life with others, and they are practically looking for ways to regroup when things don't go well. I found that place one time and was there for a while until it became pretty clear that men were not exactly a part of the group all that often. I met some lovely people there and I tried to make better relationships, but most were married and most were busy with their lives and most were sort of so full of themselves in vain that I literally just got lost in the shuffle. Vanity is not something that most people talk about, but in life, we have to produce new ways of talking. You see, loving relationships last throughout a lifetime. When you have a loving relationship with someone, you can walk away from that relationship for a time because life changes for us. And we need to focus on our lives and focus on the things going on for us. But later in life, we can come back together and say, hey, let's have a meal together. 
let's literally spend the evening talking and openly catching up on life and figuring out where we are and what we're doing and if there's anything at all we can do to make millions of dollars together with or something like that. You see, in life we have partners who are the right partners for us and sometimes we don't discover that until late in the game. We sometimes go through a couple life partners only discovering that we left one bad partner to go to the next leaping too soon because we are lonely or feeling a need to fill our souls. When we're more mature and we've spent some time alone to figure out who we are as an individual, we start to recognize certain patterns that we like about people and certain things we don't like about certain aspects of possible men in our lives. And that's true for women, according to the women I talked to, that they had to go through a couple people before they figured out who was who. There are plenty of soul-searching teachers out there who talk about spirituality who tell us that there are many life partners available to us. When, while that is practically true, numerically possible, it's not always the Lord's plan to have that go on. When we literally find the one that's for us, we stop looking at the rest. When we discover the one that's right for us, we don't care if we've had one date with them or not. We literally just know in our souls that that love that we hold dear, that we protect from all people and never talk about with one person, is literally who we love. There are people who will pilfer our files, who will get into our journals, who will lie about their rights in those moments of time, and who will steal our rights to those individuals. They will even pretend to be us online. They will pretend to be us in social engineering of text messages or taking over our accounts and acting like us when it's really not us talking to them at all. This is why talking in person and having dinner over a meal uh, or of sorts of literally being able to go on in a relationship is required in person, 3D perhaps. I guess what I'm really saying is that in order to repair a relationship, one has to literally say, hey, I'm making supper at my house. Would you like to come over and have a meal with me or help me cook and let's cook a meal together? Sometimes that's the most enjoyable way to put together and repair and rebuild a problem relationship that maybe fell apart because other people were prying into the love that was already present and trying to divide the people who are meant to be together. You see, those meant to be together still sort of think about one another. They still sort of linger in their mind about what happened to that individual. There are plenty of women who do the, that but end up with this, the wrong individuals. So how do you tell who's for who and who's not for who is something that a faith fob that I make might actually help people to determine. When my faith fob gives me a signal, I know that I should do things in a certain way. And for the most part, the results as long as they've been not been monkeyed with by man, have absolutely phenomenal, magical opportunities for me to learn from. When we're talking about faith, we're also talking about love. We're talking about the practice of love making in terms of how long it takes to woo a girl's heart is something that's up to the individual girl. Sometimes she's practically an easy person to talk to and an easy person to flirt with and an easy person to make a move on. But there are other moments in time, more mature, adult, seasoned moments in life where a person just literally says, you know what, I'm done playing the game with these people and I'm going to look for the one who will never let me go. You see, the one who never lets you go totally is the one who the Lord probably chose for you. The one who will never let you go in a healthy sort of way, meaning they let you go, but it still lingers in their mind that there might be an opportunity, is really probably the one that the Lord put love into for your life and your lifetime. The one who still loves you, the one who still wants to see you, the one who requests marriage late in life might actually be the one that the Lord says is the one for you. In life, we have moments of time to receive a marriage proposal as an invitation. It's an invitation to start dating, it's an invitation to start dating and be wed, but it's also an invitation to practically begin anew. Because once you become that betrothal, once you become that loyal, once you become that involved in another person's life, it's really about how do I make this love work for a lifetime? You see, a lot of people get married too quick, a lot of people rebound to the wrong people, and a lot of people just don't get that the Lord as a plan for their life. 
So how do you produce a loving relationship after there's been a falling out is pretty simple. You simply walk up, take the person's hand and say, I have not seen you in a while. Let's go have a meal. I'm going to put my boys at my folks' house and we're going to spend the evening talking. We might even sit on the sofa together and watch a film so we have something to socialize about in an easy way. We're going to start all over and we're just going to see how it goes and we're not going to put any pressure on either one of us other than the fact that there's a love there that is still solid and deep within a soul. We're just going to move slowly. We're not going to rush a thing. We're not going to worry about sensuality or sexuality or any of those intimacy oriented little parts of a loving relationship between men and women or possible partners and we're simply going to say let's just start again let's just make amends let's just renew our love in the lord and see where this goes you see practically in life we have moments of time to start again to forgive people to see our own sins of violating people's rights by not allowing them the right to tell us how much they love us. And openly by allowing other people into a relationship that probably should have never been involved in it in the first place. Because in lovemaking, in relationships, in intimate liaisons of talking points, if you will, and talking is a part of relationships, is that it's between two people. It's not between two people and a pastor. It's not between two people and a mother. It's not between two people and a father. And it's not between two adults and their children at most. And it's certainly not between two adults and any other adult who has an opinion on that relationship. You see, outsiders looking in don't know what insiders are feeling looking out. And the Lord puts love in a heart. And that's the most important part of deciding what the art is of love making. So when I sort of get poetic, it's because I really feel that in life, real love is about surviving the storm. The one that still stands still and says, go ahead, scream at me, it's okay. Go ahead, hit me. And I mean that gently, okay. Go ahead, be upset with me, okay. But I'm going to love you anyway is the one worth fighting for. Because practically, a lot of men will tolerate some of that stuff, but at some point, they'll just walk away. Because other women are not as difficult. Taming the Shrew is one of my most favorite Shakespearean films. There's a great rendition of the film with some very famous actors that I really loved watching. It was totally well done by Elizabeth Taylor, and uh, Burton, who I believe was the other, was the male lead, and he was sort of a curmudgeon, if you will. He wasn't the most handsome man in the room. He wasn't the most uh, prowess oriented or powerful, but he had a way of speaking and educating a waywardly woman in a way that made her understand that no matter what she said or did, his love was worth fighting for. And I guess that's the point in the moral of the story is that a man's love is worth fighting for as much as a woman's hand is worth marrying. And when a man sends a proposal, no matter how he sends it, old fashioned, in letter form or in person if he's allowed, there is a time and a period when a woman needs to really think it over and give the man a chance and produce a loving response, no matter what that might be. Of I'll think it over, or let's have a date first, or perhaps we need to talk about this a little bit of what you feel a marriage might look like in our relationship at this point. You see, that's sort of the comedy of a situation that I've been involved in is that literally I proposed to someone that I haven't seen in literally years. But I also proposed to them long ago, and I don't even know whether or not they saw that particular proposal. I was trying to utilize my prowess and marketing and technology to be unique and different than other suitors, and I can't say whether or not it went through, but also it might not have been the right timing because I can find online that things have not go perfectly swell in old relationships for her. There's always a law of timing with the Lord, and when we let the Lord in heaven guide us, when we let our souls 
sing, if you will. We find the right partner to duet with. We know what play is going on when we're listening to God saying, that's the one for you. Or when we're using a pendulum that says, that one is not for you. And openly, should I marry this person when we ask our spiritual guides, our uh, soulful keepers, our soul keepers, our angelic force around us, the angels around us, uh, kind of the name of one of my programs, but openly, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, we need a life partner that will stay the course through any storm, any discord, any difficulty, and will fight for us, protect us, and love us until the end. I talk a lot about having people around when we grow old and we age and our cellular start cells in our bodies start to decay. We, non, we want to know that the person we're with is going to be willing to wipe our ass, no pun intended, but the reality is when my father was ill, that's what we had to do for him. He couldn't do it himself anymore. And will feed us when we can't lift a fork anymore. And we had to do that too. And we'll make sure we get liquid to keep our bodies hydrated. And we'll make sure us we're in clean clothes and our diapers are clean and our nose is wiped and our hair is combed and we have the opportunity to still fellowship and worship and celebrate the children around our lives and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren if that's a possibility. But openly that's what we're talking about here is how do we produce love in the world today? How do we produce politicians who care about love is really with their platforms. You see, I think the most ideal platform of any politician is pretty simple. It's love, liberty, and life. You see, it's love that produces relationships of all forms. It's liberty that allows us the empowerment to be employed and have resources to care for our lives. And it's life that we're producing every moment, every second of the day. And it's also life that we're impacting when we stay around an individual and when we leave it, leave them, that is. When a person is left high and dry, it creates an impact that is life transforming, possibly life changing, definitely life impacting, and sometimes life debilitating. It just depends on how deeply the soul loved you. So I guess what I'm professing here is I love people. And how I love people is by telling them the truth, by sharing with them prophetic gifts that I may be allowed to do, by giving them a pastoral speech sometimes, but openly by professing God's word in their souls to say, what gives you the right to take love away from me, from someone that the Lord has so shown me is right for me that you think you're going to interfere with it? In life, we have moments of time to take back talk, to repair and rebuild relationships, to create real-time relationships, loving, peaceful, honoring, respectful relationships between partners in life, strategic alliances in business, and literally the folks that will be around for us in the thick and thin and the difficult situations and the triumphs and tribulations of our lives. Thanks for listening. This is Blake Enson of Blaze Communications LLC saying, make people the priority in love, liberty, and life.